Good morning. I'd like to call to order the Cuyahoga County Human Resources Appointment and Equity Meeting for Tuesday, January 31st. Council Clerk, will you please call the roll? Calling the roll, Ms. Brown? Here. Mr. Gallagher? Here. Mr. Jones? Here. Mr. Miller? Here. Ms. Conwell? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Is there any public comment related to the agenda? No, Madam Chair. No one has signed in. Okay. I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes from the January 17th, 2017 meeting. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. All right, we will move on to the matters referred to the committee. Council Clerk, will you read the first item into the record? Resolution 2017-0012, confirming the county executive's appointment of Dean DePiro to serve on the Cuyahoga County Public Library Board of Trustees for the term 2-1-2017 through 1-31-2024. And Ms. Burt, will you please give us a brief overview of this position? Certainly, Madam Chair. Um, County Library District is actually enabled in Ohio Revised Code. Uh, section 3375.22 determines the composition of the Board of Trustees. So in the County Library Board, uh, four are appointed by the County Executive and three are appointed by the judges of the Court of Common Pleas. The only qualification in Ohio Revised Code is that the uh, trustee shall be an elector of the library district, district or the county. Their duties are stated as uh, to provide control and management of the county library district. Uh, each uh, trustee serves for a seven-year term, and uh, today we are requesting uh, confirmation of um, Dean DePiro. He will replace outgoing board member Susan Adams, and his term would run for seven years beginning February 1st, uh, 2017, ending January 31st, 24, 2024. Sorry. The makeup of the current board is... How I'm many sorry. people? How many people make up the current board? Seven members. Seven. And if you could just give me a breakdown of male, female. Uh, you know, I don't have that information, but Miss Feldman, would you? Sure. Thank you. And if you can, you state your name and your okay. um, position. I'm sorry, Feldman. I'm the executive director of the Cuyahoga County Public Library. Our board chair is Ed Blakemore, and um, we have. Uh, other males are Robert Varley and William Leonard. And then we have Elizabeth Ehar, who was approved by this uh, council, I think it was two years ago, and um, Maria Spangler, as well as, okay, why am I having this? And Patty Schlonsky, sorry, who was also approved by this council. Thank you very much. All right, Mr. DePiro, I think if there's nothing else from you, okay. Um, if you'll step up and give us a brief overview of your experience and why you like Thank to you. serve on the Board of Trustees. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Chairwoman Brown and members of the committee. Uh, it's good to be here. It's an honor to be here to be considered for uh, this position with the Cuyahoga County Library Board. Um, I think I've, uh, I've uh, delivered a... Uh, a resume to all of you for your information as far as some of my background, but I'll briefly just give you my uh, personal and professional background and then talk a little bit about the, about the library. That's okay. How much time do you want me to? If... With respect to um, to the committee and uh, and to our other items on the agenda and, and with regards to the letter, two to three minutes will be, I'll be good. Brief. And then Great. our council, if the committee has questions, then we'll ask after. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I am uh, currently a practicing attorney for the last 22 years. I'm of counsel with the law firm of McDonald Hopkins. Um, I currently serve uh, a couple of public positions. I'm the law director for the city of Aurora in Port Portage County and serve that uh, in that capacity for the last three years. I'm also the assistant law director in the city of Broadview Heights and served in that capacity for the last five years. Um, I, practice, uh, I practice in the public sectors and private sectors. I currently sit on uh, a couple of boards, um, the Strongsville Education uh, Foundation for the last year, um, the University Hospitals Palmer Medical Center Foundation Board as well, uh, and the uh, Mount Alverna Advisory Board uh, as well. I, I, in my... Um, uh, before I uh, was in private uh, practice, I served as mayor of Parma for eight years and in the state legislature for five years uh, for st uh, state district uh, 15 and 20. I served with your colleague, uh, Mr. Miller, in that capacity. Um, uh, I've uh, had a good deal of um, experience dealing with the executive director, Sari Feldman, for about the last 15 years. She's ex exemplified great leadership for the board. I think all of you would... Uh, would share that uh, thought. 
Uh, she's done a great job, and the board has worked very cohesively with her, uh, in particular on the uh, the renovation and reconstruction of the 27 branches in the um, in the entire district. They've done a great job of um, holding the line on finances and really building state-of-the-art facilities, which has helped them, I think, um, uh, uh, skinny down the uh, uh, employment through you know different building designs and um, and and good use of technology. Um, so that was the first point I wanted to make. They've done a great job, and I think it's important that board members help oversee those processes. As I know, they continue to renovate a couple of the, the branches. The second piece is that um, it kind of goes along with the first. They've had really good financial management. The last time they went to the ballot was 2008, and I don't think there's any plans in the future. Obviously, as a board member, as you all know, uh, it's our job to be the um, uh, uh, you know watchdogs and, and uh, of the finances and to work with uh, the administration to make sure that the dollars are are spent well. Um, third, and I think is, is most uh, I, I think telling about the libraries is, you know, the li as you probably all know, the libraries aren't the same that when we were young. Um, you go and you check out a book and you leave. Now they serve as learning centers for folks. They serve as uh, job uh, job training centers. Um, the library board uh, has Project Learn, which allows folks to come get their GED. Um, you can get computer training, all types of different um, activities. Um, so I think it's important that we continue to transition the libraries into the in, into the new age and and uh, you know look for opportunities to uh, serve the public other than somewhere just to go and study or to check out library books, if you will. Uh, one of the areas that I'm interested in is the reentry programs that are being talked about for folks who, uh, uh, who may have had a, a bump in the road in their life and, and come out of prison or, or the halfway house and maybe have an opportunity for the library to step in and, and work with some of the agencies to help with reentry into the um, into the community. So I think that there's a lot of exciting opportunities like that in the future that I, I'd like to work with uh, Ms. Feldman and the other board members and uh, try to uh, do the best I can to help the, the, the 27 branches really serve all sectors of the of Cuyahoga County. So with that, it's just an honor to be considered for this position. I appreciate the opportunity. And of course, I'm happy to answer any questions of any of the members of the committee. Thank you so much, and I do want to congratulate you on your nomination. I think it is, um, we always find it honorable and noble of uh, people who want to serve in this capacity. I'm going to open the floor to questions from the committee. Mr. Miller? I'd like to congratulate you on your nomination and, and also to thank you for, for uh, uh, being willing to serve a seven-year term. That's a long commitment. And uh, first of all, I'd like to say that, uh, that we've all grown up with and, and, uh, and are used to having, uh, having good libraries. And, and uh, one thing that a lot of people uh, might not know is that libraries are, uh, are one of the items where the state of Ohio is, is typically listed as being in the top five in the country. And, terms of its library systems and so that's uh, that's a really really important service and, and certainly something that we want to continue uh, regarding the library levy is uh, is the library levy continuing or or is it or is it for a number of years where it will expire at some point madam Chair, uh, Mr. Miller, I know that um, in my conversations with Sari, she indicates the last time uh, was 2008. There's no plans to go for any new money, but I believe it's a continuing library uh, Correct. levy. Correct. Um, when we went to the ballot in 2008, we felt um, that uh, barring any unforeseen reductions from the state, um, there are small reductions, but major reductions from the state that we would be able to um, reduce our operating costs through the new capital program that we instituted, and it's proven to be true. So it's a continuing levy um, with no plans to go back to the ballot. We are okay. at um, 
two and a half mil, which is actually the lowest millage of any of the library systems in the county. Okay, thank you. And uh, uh, what do you what do you feel are the uh, the biggest challenges facing the county library system going forward? Madam Chair, uh, uh, Councilman Miller, I think I think a couple of issues. Number one, um, like all local governments, um, you know, making sure that there are no further cuts from the state of Ohio, I think, is important. And if there are, to continue to try to find ways to uh, create efficiencies, like we've done through the new building project, like that they've done through the new building projects, because of the way they've designed the buildings and done consolidation. They've been able to to uh, bring down the numbers of full time employees, which has obviously saved money. So I think finances are all, always going to be a uh, a uh, uh, a key, uh, and, and and to keep the solid financial management. The other thing is, and I touched on it a little bit, is to try to find ways to continue to have libraries fill needs in the community. Um, I mentioned the reentry program. Um, we talked. I talked with uh, the director about the fact that now you can go and get your passport at the library. I think filling an important need uh, at uh, for the community. Uh, you know, I think the the, the, the idea of reentry programs or getting people, you know, computer training, technology training, to continue to find ways where we can we can you know maximize the tax dollars that we spend so that we can continue to reach out to the community and really fill a lot of needs that are being unmet right now. So I think those are the two challenges I, I would say. And uh, does the county library system have any branches in the city of Cleveland or is that handled entirely by the uh, Cleveland Public Library? Um, we have no branches in the city of Cleveland because that is the Cleveland Public Library's district. However, because of a long uh, uh, tenured agreement in Metro Hospital. We actually have a full service um, in the Metro Hospital where patients, families, and staff can take advantage of library service. Okay. Final question. Uh, the, you do have the Cleveland system, and, and then you have uh, uh, a certain number of other communities, I forget whether it's uh, three or four or five, but you have a number of other independent systems out there. And, and my question is, uh, is whether we're content with this arrangement for the long, long term, or, or is there any uh, discussion or consideration being done to, uh, to merging some of the systems so that there's, uh, so that there's a simpler structure? Madam Chair, uh, Councilman Miller, uh, Councilman Miller, I, I've actually thought about that, and certainly uh, as a board member, I would try to help facilitate those discussions if uh, I felt uh, um, that uh, they could they they were a possibility. And I'll just give you an example. When I was mayor, we had three branches in Parma, and we talked about um, the fact that two of them were were outdated. We actually uh, consolidated two of them into one, so we went down to two branches. That obviously had some political ramifications in the community. We were able through our you know, town meetings and reaching out to the community, make people feel comfortable that we would be able to better serve the communities by having two. And frankly, it worked out very well. We were able to work through those issues that I imagine we would have the same type of issues if we were to go down a merger road. But certainly, I think my experience in dealing with that in my uh, community could help facilitate those discussions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Are there any other questions from the committee? Yes, Ms. Conwell. <clears throat> uh, through the chair to, um, to Dean, I was watching the governor's uh, proposed state uh, budget yesterday, and they talked about the library should become more work centers, that they were willing to put some more money toward, toward that. Who would actually coordinate that and ask questions? Would that be the Ohio Library right. Board? Who's going to follow up on that? I thought it was a, a great proposal, but, you know, to hopefully to the benefit of the libraries and not put on the budget that we have now. 
Great. So um, Cuyahoga County Public Library currently has four full-time career counselors on staff that work throughout the county on job and career services. We also have Ohio Means Jobs, our local um, city county workforce, counseling within our library buildings, as well as the Veterans Administration doing some particular outreach to out-of-work veterans. We have been in touch with Ryan Burgess at um, the state workforce board to talk um, additionally about ways that the libraries can step up and meet some of the governor's goals around career education with youth, as well as um, expand the role we're playing in workforce. Um, because libraries have infrastructure and we're open, um, we happen to be open seven days a week, four nights a week. Um, we have computers that are available and computer instruction, GED classes right in the library. And we also have a program that's uh, funded by the Ohio Board of Regents, which helps people prepare for the entrance exam to community college. We're perfectly positioned to wrap around services with workforce. So um, I think you'll hear more about that in the near future. Thank you. Well, thank you, because I know there was a, there, the point that touched me is because he, he knew that there's a digital divide, that everybody right. doesn't have access to internet in their right. home. So to make the library, you know, and they quoted how many people have library cards. Right. And I'm a library fan, so thank you for that. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay, I'll just touch on um, the, again, with expanding those career and education services. Those are all free programs. Are there any ideas or um, possibilities for anything that will generate revenue from the library? Uh, Madam, Madam Chair, uh, the one that I, I know I've talked to the director about is that the, the passport program actually not only uh, provides a great convenience, but is also is a, re a revenue generator. I think they get $20 per passport, something like that. So there is uh, that. I'll, I'll defer to the director on that. But certainly those are ideas. If there's an opportunity to raise revenue in situations like that, I think it's appropriate. So um, I, I will say that it is the philosophy of the uh, America's libraries and also the Cuyahoga County Public Library that libraries are uh, kind of part of the uh, free democratic society and we must maintain a free and open access to library service within our buildings. However, despite that, uh, the passport service being a sidebar, as um, Mr. DePiro mentioned, is something where um, the State Department does enable us to get revenue from issuing a first passport, and we do take photos in the library, and we generate between thirty and $50,000 a month on our passport business. Um, we would be open to additional opportunities that didn't impact library service directly. However, the library is bringing in nearly a million dollars worth of grant funded projects at this time. We have a foundation. Our foundation raised $10 million for our capital program and is now raising operating dollars. For example, they are funding a, a part-time volunteer coordinator for the library. So we are very conscious of um, our uh, operating expenses, our need for a diverse revenue portfolio, um, and we are not, uh, we are hoping not to put additional burden on local taxpayers anytime in the future. Thank you, that's excellent to hear. Um, one last question, your favorite book? Oh, my favorite book. You know, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a John Grisham fan, believe it or not. I read a lot of Grisham books. Uh, um, but the book that I really read the most because I have little kids is the Bible. We read, you know, Bible stories from time to time and they're so, um, but I'm a big Grisham fan. So. All right. With that said, if there are no questions, no more questions. Can I just ask like one that? on yeah, yours? Sure. How, how many libraries participate in the passport? I had just heard that it was one location. Um, all 27 Cuyahoga County Public Libraries are passport acceptance locations and take your picture seven days a week, four nights a week. Madam Chair, just to follow up, I, my, my, the books that I read the most are, are though, is uh, Go Dog Go, uh, Mickey Mouse, <laughs> and uh, the, the Disney uh, because of nighttime stories. But. Nice, <laughs> nice, nice, nice. All right, if there are no additional questions, comments, or concerns uh, from the committee, I'd like to make a motion to, uh, and I'll ask Ms. Feldman, does this need a second reading suspension? Is there a meeting coming up, or can we do three readings? 
you're a board meeting, so if you're willing to suspend the third reading, uh, we would appreciate it, but it's, uh, of course, up to the Okay. If there are no objections for the, from the committee, I'd like to make a motion to send this to the full body of the council under second reading suspension. Do I have a second? Second. I have a question. Yes. When is the February board meeting? Um, it's uh, Tuesday, February 28th. Is that a Tuesday? Yeah. The last Tuesday of the month. Okay. We need the suspension for that. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, I, it's because um, although... Um, Ms. Adams could sit. Um, Can you step to the mic? I'm sorry. Sorry, that's, I apologize. That's OK. Oh, um, although sure. uh, Susan Adams could sit, continue to sit, she would prefer not to at this time. And we'll respect that. Thank you. All right, we've had a, um, it's been moved and seconded. And if there are no additional questions or comments, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Thank you. This will move to the full body of the council. It's good seeing you. Thank good you for to see you. Taking Thanks for the time. opportunity. Appreciate it. Thanks. All right. And Council Clerk, will you please read our second item into the agenda? Resolution 2017-0018, amending resolution number 2015-0247, which amended resolution number 2014-0258, which made an award on requisition number 30390 to Caremark PCS Health LLC for group health care benefits, including pharmacy benefit manage management services for county employees and their eligible dependents, and Cuyahoga County Benefits Regionalization Program participants, employees, and their eligible dependents for the period 1 1 2015 through 12 31 2017 by changing the total amount not to exceed from $42,989,733 to $60,652,540.67. Thank you. And is there someone here to speak to us regarding this item? Good morning, Madam Chairman Good and morning. committee members. I am Holly Woods, the Director of HR for Benefits and Compensation. And I also have with me my um, numbers guru, Kendra Zuzi, she's my business services manager. So as we get into some of those details, Kendra has been helping me um, navigate through the budget, um, some of the historical pieces, where we've been, how we got here, and how we're going to fix some of these things. So um, as most of you know, I've been with the county now for about nine months. And one of the primary objectives with me coming in and having the benefit of just the recent benefit audit was we knew there were things that we needed to turn our attention to. And so having um, good resources in place such as Kendra and our, um, our partners with Oswald have really helped us kind of uncover and go through some of the details. So with that, we are here today to ask for approval to amend two of our health care provider contracts, Medical Mutual for their, um, their, their plan and the Metro Health Plans, and Caremark CVS, which is our drug prescription um, cost related to all the health care plans. So we're asking for additional funds for each vendor that are in line with what we expect, expect claim cost activity and the administrative cost to be for 2017. So we are not asking for additional, additional budget appropriations. Uh, sufficient appropriations have been provided in the 2017 annual budget um, that was approved in December. Uh, these amendments today allow us to encumber the actual funds that match the 2017 expected claim cost activity. So, and again, that's based on our actual enrollment numbers for both the county and regional plans. So um, at this time, we're not asking to amend um, our other health care contract with UHC, but based on early projections, we do show that an adjustment will be needed and will be coming forward at a later time to get the, the adjustment for UHC as well. So again, the current estimate is still within the approved 2017 budget. Um, and again, we'll continue to monitor all the health care costs very closely and provide updates throughout the year, looking at the next update to be mid-year, to let you know what the activity costs look like and um, to inform you if any future adjustments are needed. So this is the third and final year for these provider contracts. We, an RFP process will start sometime after mid-year. You said after mid-year, the mm -hmm. RFP process will right. start. Mm -hmm. Does that seem like we'll be a little bit behind the eight ball again? I'm a little concerned as a new uh, committee of this chair, and, and that's the prior committee, have very strict 
uh, guidelines as far as getting third readings and, and not having things walk on with such short notice. And I like to maintain that standard and make sure that we are um, appropriating enough time so that we don't run into this again in the future. So would mid mid-year give us enough time to avoid having to see this in February of next year? Sure, and, and, and I just want to draw the distinction. This is a little bit different than the RFP process and actually um, going through the process to invite other health care vendors. This is why we're here today as a result of just making sure the budget is allocated correctly to pay the claims. So it's claims projections um, that really has us here today versus the awarding of contracts moving forward. But rest assured, we want to make sure that everything is done timely, understanding the processes that have to go through, and we'll be working closely with all of our partners to make sure that we do it enough time to get through all those processes and, and meetings so that we're all comfortable and we're meeting those deadlines. So if I understand you correctly, you said the claims projections were was the reason for the the delay with this agreement? Correct. So again, this is our third year of the contract with our health care providers. And looking back, and I believe all of you were provided a spreadsheet that reviews, it's, it's titled the 2015-17 Overview of Benefit Carrier Contracts. This gives you a picture of why we're here requesting the money that we are today. So looking back historically, and, and does everybody have the chart? Okay, so looking at this chart and just to kind of outline how we got here, um, first and foremost, looking at what we've done recently, open enrollment. So we've made some changes to our plans. We made some changes with our regional partner plan, and with that comes changes in enrollment. So we see fluctuations in employees who are participating in the plan, meaning some employees chose not to take county benefits. We see employees, because of our educational efforts, choosing different health care plans based on their medical needs. So we had a shift overall just in our numbers, who's enrolled in what plans and what type of plan they're enrolled in. So to look at the budget that we're going to need and, and the money that needs to be allocated for those budgets, we have to have a clear picture of where those numbers fall. And as you know, open enrollment, we extended open enrollment. We gave extensions to our regional partners if they, to decide if they wanted to stay in our plan. So that took us well into December before we had some of those final enrollment numbers. Secondary comes just looking at the three-year overview of the benefit contract. So going back to the chart there in front of you, looking at um, specifically the Caremark contract. The original authorized amount, $40.189,733 million. Um, looking at that, there haven't been any amendments made to that plan, but the current balance for that contract is $4.9 million, just a little over that. Our future payments, just for the remainder of this contract, are at $17.8 million. So we need to amend that in order to, again, allocate those funds and an additional 12.851878.47 cents. Um, again, next section down from there, looking at the regional program. When this was originally set up, the funds weren't segregated into regional and county. It was all one bucket. Um, just to kind of put it simply. So looking at that, there was not an original authorized amount specifically for the regional claim. So you see there, we did come and amend um, in 2015 for 2.8 million. We should have come and amended in 16 and again here in 17 because again, those funds were not uh, originally allocated specifically for the regional plan. So when you look over there, we're-, we're Right there, why, why weren't they? It's a good question. Um, unfortunately, a number of the members that are working on this now weren't here in 2015. Um, you know, this was put together at the recommendation, I, I believe, with a, a committee with our previous healthcare consultant. And so, I, I don't know. I don't know why it was set up that way. But we quickly realized that it it needed to be adjusted. In the, in the future, will it will be allocated separately? We won't see this 
presented in this fashion. You'll see it, but it'll be in two separate right. in two separate buckets. You'll see it segregated into county versus regional. Mm -hmm. um, as we've talked through a couple different things, it's very important. These programs are two different programs. Although they're under the umbrella of Cuyahoga County, we need to maintain them separately right. because county dollars spent for the county program, regional is paying for regional. And so again, part of that importance of separating it. We will always show the numbers, but it won't be in one bulk um, area. It will be two separate. Go on. So as you see there, the estimated future payments for that program, 2.8 million. So again, uh, making amendment for the 4.8, um, 10, 929, 20. Again, that regional program is a little different. Um, you know, as we run that, we budget for the funds and the regional partners pay for the claims and the administrative costs. So we recoup those expenses. So it's a little bit different than the county plan, but important to show those numbers. As you go down, again, you'll see the layout for uh, Medical Mutual, Metro Health, um, the authorized amounts versus the pay total payments, the balances. So what we're looking at is the projections, the claims projections, and the funds that were allocated back originally in 2015 needed some adjustment today in order to get us through the final year of our contract. So what this does, this authorizes us to continue paying our carriers for the remainder of our the last year of our contract. So in 2016, EBI wasn't here. So you, you said it was the previous uh, consultant as to why. So in these, uh, when the, the contracts were originally set forth and the amounts were determined, it was probably in 2014 that actually laid out how much the claims projections and what we were going to need for that. Okay. Um, it's, so it's looking like the... The care mark is roughly about twenty million per year on the average. Combined, approximately. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, and I and I guess the other question would be, could we use that as a projections in the future or? Just as ide ideally, you're, you're saying using the 20 million as a projection. So again, it just depends. It, it depends on how many employees are enrolled in our plans, um, if they're enrolled in family plans, employee plans. Because we're not that giving a specific number. This is still a not to exceed. So it's kind of a, an estimate. So I'm just trying Correct. to get some understanding. So. Mm -hmm. Of, of why we're using the 20 million or if that should be a consistent number moving forward. I just want to make sure I understand. Moving forward. So, and I and I will invite Kyle Anthony up just to talk about the projections, but it, it is a, a number of things that we look at. Mm -hmm. So again, looking at, um, because we're potentially spending near 20 million today doesn't necessarily represent they're going to be spending net nearly 20 million next year. It truly, you have to take a snapshot on the um, entire population, what the plans that they're enrolled in, the health conditions of that population. So as our population gets more sick, more healthy, those numbers could swing. So I, that's why I said I don't want to, 20 million isn't necessarily going to be a continuous number. We literally have to look at that every year to make sure based on what the population's experiencing, the health plans that they're enrolled in, where that number is going to be adjusted. Because these are three year contracts, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, with regards to it being a three year contract, are, are these going to, you said we're starting in the mid of next year for the RFP? Are we we're really doing the RFP? Or are we looking just to extend? We're looking for an RFP for a new three year contract. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. And you said Kyle? Yes. Plus, Kyle, just to speak to the, the projections and, and getting an idea of, of how those um, carry on looking at the future. Absolutely. Good morning. My Good name morning. is Kyle Anthony. I'm with Oswald Companies. Uh, the question regarding whether the projected $20.6 million for pharmacy expense could continue past this year. Uh, pharmacy expenses are increasing right now at a rate of about 8% per year. So we're comfortable with that projection as a not to exceed for a one-year period. But due to the RFP process that will be conducted this year, we'll see a different figure on that as we move forward from 2018 through the next three-year contract cycle. Okay. Thank you. Are there any questions, comments, or concerns from the committee? Mr. Miller? 
I have a number of questions. First of all, uh, the first piece of legislation and the second piece of legislation, are these basically uh, two different provider options that we offer to both the county employees and the regional partners? Is that what we have here? That's correct. Okay. And... Uh, and how many regional partners did we have last year, and how many stayed on for 2017? I believe we were at 20 last year. We had 10 that exited the program and 10 remaining. Okay. And uh, what was the rate of increase that we charged our regional partners for 2017? So the rate of increase varied based on their utilization and claims in the different programs. So it, it was a, a, a range um, based and, on. And what was the range from low to high? Uh, the range without any plan design changes at the, uh, I can tell you the average of the group was about 14%. And the range went from 12% to about 48%. And the one that was 48%, is that one that renewed, or are you talking about one that uh, did not stay with us? Uh, that was uh, an entity that did not stay in the program. I see. Not surprising. Uh, in, in the last quarter of last year, I heard, I heard various projections as to... Uh, how the regional program would fare financially for 2016. I heard uh, various numbers ranging from break even to, uh, to lose three or four million. And my question is, how did it actually turn out? That's, that's a good question. It's a little early for us to have a specific number in mind. And the reason for that, or a specific number rather that we can provide you, the reason that it's impossible at this point is that for individuals who went to a medical provider uh, during the months of November and December, their claims are not yet fully realized. Uh, so as an example, if I go to a doctor's office in the middle of December, it takes a month or two for that claim to make it through the system. So we're not quite complete with the 2016 liabilities. We still have an incurred but not reported number that will take a few months for us to uh, realize before we can give you a definitive answer to that. What would be the current projection? Uh, the current projection at this point is that we'll see overall that pool will have lost uh, somewhere around $3 million. And uh, has the... Uh, Has the way we do this been modified so that this won't happen again in 2017 or future years, or could the same thing happen again depending on performance? Uh, thank you for the question. It, it's obviously impossible for us to predict with 100% certainty what the cost will be. Um, however, we have put safeguards into that program to prevent this from occurring in the future. So the first step that we took was that we have more appropriately rated each of the individual regional partners that participate in the program. Secondly, uh, Medical Mutual of Ohio has provided additional insurance on the regional program that will provide us with a maximum liability for that program. So it's impossible for us on a go-forward basis to see the same types of losses because we've corrected the setup of that program moving forward. And uh, does the general fund have to incur the $3 million or whatever it turned out to be uh, loss, or, or is this carried over as a negative balance and we hope to recoup it with a positive variance in a future year? I, I can tell you, I, I can't answer to how the accounting works internally at the county, but we do have a five-year strategic plan that will erase any of the deficits that we incurred as we correct this program over that next five-year period. In the chart that... Uh, you provided under a medical mutual regional. It's showing 
a balance of a negative thirty million three hundred and sixty-five thousand dollars. Can you explain what that means and what the significance of, of that is? That Mr. Point? Miller, we haven't read that um, item into the agenda, but I do. We would like so if you could hold that question till we get to that item, please. No problem. Okay, so you'll be prepared for that. Uh, so, but why don't why don't you? Uh, Answer the same question as regards to the uh, the two million and ten thousand dollar negative balance shown on the regional fund for the Caremark contract. Sure. So again, looking at the annual estimates and the original authorized amount, looking at the regional program, the funds were not segregated or budgeted specifically for that regional program. So when you see there. The in the 15 through 16, there's no funds that were fully budgeted for that. It was all together in one budget. Uh, and so the negative comes from all of the claims that were coming in, the expenses being paid from the program. So that means that uh, the claims from that program exceeded the revenues. Correct. Yes. Okay. Uh, And again, going back to just the appropriate rating for those programs and the adjustments that we've made more recently going forward with, with each of our partners. And uh, what is this, the assumed increase in health care costs for 2017? The overall average increase that we assumed uh, without any plan changes, just the pure cost of inflation was just under 10%. And that's combined between medical and pharmacy expenses. And am I correct that the uh, the amount that we charged our regional partners is more than that because we also want to build reserves? Uh, reserves are necessary, uh, but the amount that we are charging the regional partners was adjusted more significantly due to the fact that they were underrated in previous years. So uh, actually, there's uh, there's three things. Number one is costs are going up almost 10%. Number two is that they were previously underrated. And number three is that we want to build reserves. That is, is correct. That correct. Okay, right. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Councilwoman Conwell? Just wanted to, through the chair, just wanted to follow up on that $2 million deficit. Um, that will be, through the strategic, five-year strategic plan, that will be offset it or it'll balance out. Is that is that correct understanding? I, I think it's important to point out that we've actually recovered some of the revenue that goes against that $2 million deficit. The issue on the page in front of you is simply that those funds were not segregated or budgeted as part of this process. So our deficit, whatever it may be, and it, as it exists in totality when we wrap up all of 2016, whatever deficit does exist as part of our longer term strategic plan is being recovered as we work to control the plan costs. So this two million could go to half, half a million, is what it you're could. saying? Absolutely. Okay, thank you. And I just, I just want to point out that one of the reasons you, uh, Holly said the contracts were walked on is because you said that we were looking for 2016-year actuals, and then Kyle said that there's still a liability, so we're not getting actuals then. We, we do know in 2016 we spent so far $2.4 million. Uh, $2 million. You can see that on the sheet in front of you. Mm -hmm. That does not include those amounts from 2016 that are yet to be paid in 2017. So the estimate that's on the sheet in front of you for 2017 of $2.8 million does realize some of those expenses left over from 2016. Okay. Uh, I have a further question. Yes, Mr. Miller. My question is... Uh, is what are the impacts, if any, of the fact that we went from a regional program that has 20 participants to one that now only has 10 participants? And, uh, and, and in particular, does, uh, does this uh, uh, impair our ability to recover what we've lost because of the fact that, uh, that uh, 
participants were previously underrated? Uh, the regional program at 10 participants is still a considerable amount of uh, leverage that we're able to use to benefit those participants collectively uh, because they're, they're benefiting from, as the county is, a larger pool and larger collective buying power. Uh, the law of large numbers might be a little bit more significant if that group had perhaps 30 or 40 regional participants. It's tough to say. What's more important, though, is that the participants in that pool are appropriately rated and that that pool is solvent. So when we came into 2017, the rating of the regional participants took into account that there could be some termination of members and that we couldn't rely simply on an all for one, one for all approach. So that was factored into the rates as we came into this year. So we're still comfortable that the rates are sufficient to cover the liabilities of the remaining partners. Okay. All right. Um, and you, yes, Ms. Conwell. Through the chair, to follow up on in the line of questioning of Councilman Miller, the rates, this is a, I thought the regional benefits program was for something that we weren't getting, uh, um, we couldn't profit, so to speak. It was, you know, that's what was told by the previous administration, that it, you know, we were basically doing a favor and we could we could charge a small administrative fee. Is that is that still going forward? So when you talk about I'm kind of confused a little bit when you talk about the rates changing for the regional partners. So if you could explain that a little bit. Sure. So we're not profiting at all from the regional partners. Okay. Um, their risk and their expense exists in a pool of participants. And we need to make sure that we have enough revenue coming in to simply cover the liability of that pool. So the rates that they pay generates that revenue for us. And those rates needed an adjustment to drive sufficient revenue to cover the liability of the pool. The so county is only pulling a, an administrative expense off of that program. So the rates for the regional partners could fluctuate is what you're, what you're saying. That is correct, although they are locked in for a 12-month period of time. Okay, only 12 months. Okay. Yes. And do they have an out clause in that 12-month period? Uh, they do have an out clause. As uh, well as we do. Uh, as well, yes, that is correct. Okay. It, we would not abandon a regional partner in the middle of the year. Uh, we make, like an insurance company would, a commitment that will provide them with access to the coverage over that 12-month period. Uh, there are certain contractual provisions that would allow, you know, a separation of that agreement, but... We do make a commitment to extend coverage to them for, for the 12-month period. There's one regional partner that exercised a six-month provision, um, and at that point, then they'd be able to also get out. I'm just wondering if you could update the committee uh, in regards to who's now a chart uh, to the chair uh, and the committee members, who is now on and who, was, who left, as well as the rate different, differential from when they were on there before and how you adjusted that to uh, bring it up. Sure, we can provide you with that. Okay. Madam Chair. Yes, Mr. Miller. Uh, first, uh, the information that Ms. Conwell just requested, could you send that to all of us? Mm -hmm. Yes, and, that's Okay, and uh, uh, a question, does, does the uh, current Uncertainty that we're entering into regarding the Affordable Care Act have any significant impact on this program, or is this kind of kind of in its own place that's separate from that? Right now, it would be very difficult for us to speculate on what uh, ripple effect could happen. There's so many uh, proposals that are out there right now regarding the updates to the Affordable Care Act. It would it would be too early for us to tell. And, Madam Chair. Uh, if if the chair would be willing, uh, I would like to hear both uh, both pieces of legislation presented before voting on either one of them. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Um, and before we before we move to the next uh, before we move to the next item, I would request from uh, you a full presentation on the status of the health care plan and the general re uh, general regionalization program um, for this entire committee. So um, we'd like to have a presentation in an open setting. So if you could 
start working on that and we'll follow up with you to coordinate to see when it would be an appropriate time and some of the things that we'd like to um, specifically see in that presentation. Sure, and uh, Madam Chairman, in, in, a, in addition to just our goal is to also provide you with an open, um, a review of what occurred during open enrollment and changes with the plans where employees shifted and just kind of an overview of that entire process as well. Thank you. Uh, Council Clerk, will you read the next item into the agenda, please? Resolution 2017-0019, amending resolution number 2015-0095, which amended resolution number 2014-0259, which made an award in requisition number 30390 to Medical Mutual of Ohio, doing business as Medical Mutual Services, LLC, for group health care benefits, including medical and pharmacy benefit manage management services, for county employees and their eligible dependents and Cuyahoga County Benefits Regionalization Program participants, employees and their eligible dependents for the period 1-1-2015 through 12-31-2017 by changing the total amount not to exceed from $141,636,022 to $211,868,212.78. Thank you. Um, I know we touched on some of the explanations when the previous uh, previous piece of uh, previous resolution. So I will ask you to give us an overview on this specific item. Madam Chairman and committee members. So similar to the previous one, as I mentioned, this approval is to mend the contract. We're asking for additional funds for the vendor that are in line with what we expect um, claims activity to be. Again, uh, we're not asking for the additional budget appropriations. The appropriations were budgeted in December. Um, so again, this will just allow us to encumber the funding levels um, expected um, based on our expected claim cost activity. Mr. Miller, I know you had a question specifically with regards to this. Item. I, I do have I do have a couple of questions. Okay. Um, the first question is uh, is if you could explain the uh, the thirty million three hundred and sixty five thousand dollar negative negative variance on the uh, on the regional fund. I'll let uh, Kendra Zuzi review that for you. Good morning, Kendra Zuzi, HR. Um, I think it's important to note that the amendments that occurred for the regional in 2015 were late in the year. So what I did was I actually, I think the county funds were being borrowed to pay the regional program early in 15. And so I did pull out what those actual regional expenses were. So that's why I think you see that negative is because those funds were being paid out of a different fund early on. And then later on, the amendment came through. But I'm reflecting it here to show actual regional expenses. Does that make sense? Uh, I'm sorry, but actually it does not. <laughs> uh, if, if, you could just, if you could just, in layman's terms, Tell me what that's what that thirty million dollar negative balance means. What what occurred to create that? So again, it, it's really looking at the claims payment. So we we've talked about a couple different funds. We have our self insurance fund, and now we have the regional fund, and they're two separate pieces. Again, the intent of to totally segregate those two plans, so that as you look at the budget, what's going in, what's coming out, you can see specifically it's all separated. It's not in one big um, one big budget. So looking at that amount, as you can see, there was the funds were not allocated to the regional fund. That regional fund did not exist previously in um, in earlier years. So but as but now they're se segregated. Correct. And so that's why you see there were zero funds that were designated for the regional fund in 15, 16, and 17 for those plans. We did have an amendment late in 15. Um, there should have been an amendment in the, the next two years. Um, again, allocating those funds specific to the regional fund. So the, all the claims, everything was being paid, but it wasn't coming out of the regional fund where it should have been. So again, because those funds were not there, there was a $30 million, 365, 171, that wasn't accounted for out of that regional fund. It was being pulled from other funds. So uh, does that mean that the regional fund operated at a deficit of $30 million? 
it, it does not. It, it, it wasn't operating at a deficit because if, I'm trying to think of the best way to, to explain it. it. It didn't exist previously. So uh, how did it in fact operate? <laughs> So if I could, it's a great question. So if I could clarify, the regional fund had premiums that were coming into the program and the county was collecting those premiums to pay for the liabilities of the regional program. This is simply a function of the fact that the prior consultants and the prior individuals that were involved in setting up this program did not come to council and specifically ask for the appropriations to be earmarked for the payment of regional fund liabilities. So revenue came in expenses were there. The money is still back to what we had discussed earlier with a projected deficit of about $3 million. This is simply due to the fact that appropriations weren't requested. In our review with the internal auditor about a year ago, we learned that the process that was used historically is not the appropriate process and this remedies so that we can get back to that appropriate process. Uh, Madam Chair, the uh the minus $3 million number, and let's just for the moment presume that that's the number. I know that it's still, it's still uh, subject to some variation. Is that, does that reflect the performance of the program in 2016, or does that reflect the performance of the program since its inception through the end of 2016? That reflects the uh, performance of the program through the end of 2016. From the beginning through the end of 2016. That is correct. Okay. And uh, if, if in 2017 we're able to generate a positive variance, are we able to apply that positive variance against the deficit or do we simply have to uh, accept accept the three million or so loss and write it off? No, any proceeds beyond our liabilities this year can be used to manage the deficit that exists in the regional pool. And a final question. Uh, uh, what is the urgency of this legislation? Does it need to be passed uh, out of committee today? Does it need to be passed under suspension? Uh, are, are there time constraints? What, where are we at on this? There are time constraints. So the, the reason for the walk-on uh, last week mm -hmm. is because, again, this is to approve the allocation of funds so that we can pay our health care carriers. So if it's not um, approved and if it's not uh, escalated, there will be a delay in, in our ability to make payments. So we are requesting uh, a second reading suspension. So uh, we owe money at this time, is that correct? At this time, we are paid in full. Is that accurate? No. Which, go Medical ahead. Mutual and Metro Health have not been paid yet this year. For 17. So right. We, this, the 30 million negative is the difference between what was approved by resolution versus what the expenses incurred and then future expenses. That's who, the negative number that you see. In terms of our next payment, who do we owe and, and how much and when is it due? We still owe Medical Mutual and Metro Health Services approximately $4.4 million at this point. And how long have we owed it to them for? Since the beginning of January. Okay, okay fine. Thank you. Why the, why the delay? I mean, we knew this was coming. I guess that's ultimately what this committee is, is most concerned about. Right. So again, as I mentioned, a, a lot of this hinges on the fact that we have to wait and see where our numbers fall as a conclusion of open enrollment. And again, just the, the fluctuations in the regional program. So we could have come to the board and asked for a number based on some projections. Um, but our goal was to make sure that that was accurate. Um, a lot of the things that we've been talking about is accuracy. We don't want to come with a number that we didn't have solid projections on. We wanted to make sure that we had the final numbers to truly reflect this. It's been quite an undertaking um, just with all the changes we made with open enrollment, the benefit plans, the regional partners. 
auditing the data, as, as you guys well know, just the auditing of our data and making sure everything we have is accurate. We wanted to make sure everything what we had was accurate in order to come to you with an appropriate number. Okay, I can appreciate that, but I guess part of the, the frustration for, for me specifically is um, <coughs> I'm getting, I feel like I'm getting mixed messages, like we, we, we've got some estimates, not actuals, year in, yes, no. Um, so I'm personally a little bit um, troubled by that. Um, Madam Chairman, and if, if I can say, with the nature of health care, the nature of how we are planning our budget with the claims coming. Unfortunately, it's a lot of projections. We're doing a, a lot of analysis on what happened, what's happening in the market, where your population is. So it is, it's, it's, all, it's all a kind of a shell game to try and determine the best numbers to use. So I'll say the frustration is shared. It, there's no crystal ball that says this is exactly what you're going to need. And with everything that we've been doing this year in the county to get our systems in place and make sure everything's solid, that's why the delay was there. Um, last year we did this. We did it too early. Our projections were wrong. So unfortunately, there's always going to be a sense of we are truly projecting. And uh, we want to make sure that those projections can be as solid as possible. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, the other, I guess the other thing that I would say that is also um, leaving me a little bit unsettled is that with regards to the regional um, the regional programs is that we keep saying it was the previous consultant but if my if my memory serves me correctly the previous consultant was on in, in 15 correct and that number was separated out so it looks like when the previous consultant left that we dropped the ball that the county dropped the ball as far as like not earmarking those dollars for the regional program so it's just a comment i don't expect a, a, a response but i do want to make note that that is how it appears um, I think Councilwoman Conwell had a question. Uh, through the chair, I just want to go back to, you said we owe Medical Mutual and, and Metro Hospital. Um, that's why you need the second reading suspension. You said roughly $4 million, and you said for the year 2017. So we're just beginning 2017. So how is that set up? Are we, are we actually paying for uh, services before we have them or no the the payments come in weekly i wire money weekly so so you're saying from january 1st to this date and i'm are we in yes, i'm paid last through, day of the month we paid all of our um claims through december 31st 2016 for medical mutual and metro health but been unable to pay 2017 claims of invoices Okay, I had another question, but uh, it'll come back to me. Okay. Any other questions, comments, or concerns from the committee? Uh, Ms. Townwell has it uh, registered. No, but I can uh, always ask it later. Okay. Um, again, I don't know how much more I could express that this cannot happen again with the walk-ons and especially for such large dollar amounts and I understand it was allocated but clearly our providers have not been paid this month and that is um, a poor reflection on us in planning I, and in, in my humble opinion um, if there are no questions comments or concerns and seeing that this is yes <laughs> <laughs> came back to me Go ahead. okay in the previous administration um, always the final part of the year was when they had to crunch their numbers, everything had to come in, and they really, we always had to have this committee during the uh, holiday season um, because of that. And then that way we would be able to be fiscally ready to roll out the new year. Is that what you're trying to aim to get to? Absolutely. So looking at the timing of this and even just with our approach to open enrollment this year is, um, you know, as, as you know, we we had a dependent audit. And with all the changes, we did allow our employees and again, even the regional partners more time, more time to digest all the information to respond to what we needed. So even through the dependent audit, we were going through, we made extensions through the end of the year. 
So with everything that we tried to fit in there, and again, the, the ultimate goal was to get everything right moving forward, that we were still finalizing numbers and are still finalizing numbers through the end of the year. So the discussion of why didn't this happen in December, we were still closing out open enrollment and still finalizing a lot of those processes through December, just to, again, make sure our employees had enough time to adjust, get the information in that they needed, so they weren't dropped from plans and other things like that. So open enrollment will remain in November? which is correct. I, I remember the end of the year was always the busiest time for you guys. I, it is. And, and I think even more so this year because we combined it with a full active open enrollment and the dependent audit. So we had two large activities going on at once, but that active open enrollment where employees were meeting with benefit educators, it was, it was very time consuming. It was a very heavy lift. So it did take us later in the year than I think in the future will be because we're not gonna we're not gonna do this same process every year. We'll always have open enrollment, but it won't be so encompassing. And you always have to wait on those fourth quarter projections as well. Correct. Okay. Mr. Miller. Uh, just a few comments. It, it's uh, it's clear that there was an earlier point. Uh, around 2014 or 2015 that uh, this, that this program was not properly managed. And uh, it seems to relate both to uh, that the ratings were off target for the regional partners and also that the, uh, that the uh, county employees program and the, and the regional program was not properly segregated. And uh, it also appears that uh, that once you uh, became aware of this program, that this problem, that it took a long time to sort it out. Uh, presumably, because of the com complexity of what's going on here and, and, and how difficult it was to first of all figure out exactly what was going wrong and then, then figure out how to fix it. Uh, on a positive note, because of the uh, segregation and, and the re-rating, it, uh, it appears that you now have a much better handle on it, and, and, uh, and that's a good thing. And uh, I think that we... Uh, do need to get this back on track and, and to approve the pay payments. But I think that uh, this is an area where our, uh, our committee needs to oversee this very closely. And I think we need to have some, uh, some mid-course reports during the course of the year to, uh, to get a sense of, uh, of what the numbers are and, and whether it's, it's performing as we're expecting going forward. Thank you, Mr. Miller. Any additional comments, questions, or concerns from the committee? I just wanted to finish up the, uh, just to make sure that the stop loss and all that, you're going to try to really get it into the final quarter uh, presenting to us because I think we voted on stop loss not too long ago. But in the beginning, they were all together because it was the, like I said, it was the busiest time of the mm -hmm. year. You were trying to crunch your numbers, but we wanted to make sure we had projected right. And that'll be kind of hard with the, so I don't know, with the budget, with the biennial budget coming up and us probably meeting in November, you guys will still not have those final final numbers. But I, I agree with Councilman Miller, uh, but it's the chair's call if we should go forward with, uh, it's, it seems like uh, from everything that they're uh, sharing with us that maybe we should go back to the, to the, uh, to the beginning and have all those those reports and see how this administrated administration is uh, presenting those things because there's some discrepancies in how we were told before things are going and, and how you guys are looking forward. So Well, I hope to uh, have that information in the presentation that we've discussed prior. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, any additional questions, comments, or concerns? There being none. Um, with respect to the providers and so that there is not a loss of um, service to um, our employees, I would like to make a motion to move items B and C to the full body of the council under second reading suspension. Do I have a second? Second. 
All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any objections? This will move to the full body of the council. Um, thank you. Thank you. All right. Is there any miscellaneous business? No, Madam Chair. Any, any other public comment? No, Madam Chair. No one has signed in. Thank you. This meeting is adjourned.